Hi everyone, Chodesh Tov. It's wonderful to be here as part of this incredible festival, um, the Light of the Infinite Festival on this special day of Rosh Chodesh Sivan. My name is Rena Perkel. I'd like to say a big thank you to Eris Sefer for putting together this amazing um, gathering with all these really special teachers coming together. I'd like to um, dedicate the learning today of the, of the festival and my specific class. I'd like to dedicate in honor of Erez's mother, Frida Levana Bat Shalom, that in the merit of our learning, her neshama should have on Aliyah um, to Gan Eden. I'd also like to dedicate this class um, in honor of my father, David Ben Moshe and Zahara, and may his neshama also have an Aliyah to Gan Eden in the merit of our learning today. Okay, let's get started. So today is Rosh Chodesh Sivan, um, and in a few days we're going to be celebrating the special holiday of Shavuot, the Mount Sinai revelation, the time when Hashem revealed Himself to the Jewish people and gave us the Holy Torah and the Ten Commandments, and it's a very special holiday which the mystics call the holy wedding um, with God being the groom and the Jewish people being the bride. In the Zohar we learn that the night before the wedding is a very special night where we do the Tikkun Lel Shavuot where we stay up all night and help the bride adorn herself for the wedding by learning Torah all night. The bride is parallel to the Sephira of Malchut, um, and also parallel to Shekhinah, which is the, the Divine Presence, and some call the Divine Feminine. The Zohar is very unique in the sense that it puts a strong emphasis on the relationship between Hashem and the Jewish people within the context of the masculine and feminine energies of the Divine. And in essence, the Zohar um, presents the story between Hashem and the Jewish people as a love story. So today we're going to unpack that love story a little bit and we'll start from the beginning. How did this love story begin? <coughs> Excuse me. In the story of creation in uh, Bereshit in Genesis it says, Bereshit bara elokim atashamayim ve'etar. It's Bereshit kabal in the Zohar um, one way that they break up the word Bereshit is Bet Rashit. Bet means the letter Bet. It also represents the number two. And Rashit means beginning. That in the beginning there were two. Meaning that in the beginning God created polarity. Now Hashem the in, is the infinite or Ein Sof. Right? The light of the infinite. That's what this festival is named um, for the light of the infinite. The or Ein Sof. And that aspect of God is beyond polarity. It's beyond gender of masculine and feminine. It, it's it's the level of Keter and beyond. That's the part of Hashem that we can't relate to. It's beyond um, all understanding. However, when God created this world, He went through a process of Tzimtzum. Tzimtzum means contraction. And basically created a space within Himself to create this world that we have now in order to give to the other in order to create a relationship and in, and in this process there was polarity was created so when god created the world he was wanting to reveal himself and express himself and we see um it's very interesting because this month of uh, sivan in astrology is called gemini and the symbol for gemini is the twins um, and it's supposed to represent relationships and that's essentially what's happening during Shavuot is Hashem is establishing in a formal way his relationship with the Jewish people which initially started with the patriarchs with Avraham, Yitzchak and Yaakov and then with the tribes but only after um, Exodus and coming out of Egypt and, and standing at Mount Sinai was the relationship formalized in the sense of a wedding and the Torah representing the, the marriage contract between us and Hashem. 
So let's continue with the creation story as it'll help us understand this relationship. When Hashem created the world and he created Adam, Adam was created as one creature. And it says in says Bereshit, Well, let's let's make man in our image. Hashem created Adam in his image. Hashem created Adam as a masculine as a masculine and a feminine. So we see here that initially the masculine and feminine were created as one, as one unit, and uh, with two faces joined together back, back to back. And then there's the second account of Adam and Chava where Hashem says that it's not good for man to be alone and um, Hashem puts Adam to sleep and then separates um, Chava from Adam and at that point she becomes his Ezer Konegdo, his helpmate. <coughs> so there's many ways we can interpret this. Um, obviously, the Genesis story is very, very um, deep, and there's many layers of uh, interpretations where we could take it. But for our purposes today, for what we want to explore about the divine energies of masculine and feminine, let's focus on this concept of what it means to be created in the image of Hashem. So in Kabbalah, we learn that there is a tree of life, which is the the um, a term used to represent the, the ten sefirot. And the ten sefirot are the ten divine emanations through which Hashem um, rules the world and expresses himself and interacts with the world. And just like there's a cosmic tree of life, there's also an individual tree of life that each person has within their soul and their body. And so um, with the way Kabbalah interprets it is that just like there's the upper tree of life, the cosmic tree of life, there's also the human individual tree of life. And so in this tree of life where you have the 10 spherot, you have the upper three spherot, which are the um, spiritual intellectual spherot. Then you have the, the which are Keter, Chochma, Bina, and Dat. And then you have the seven lower emotional spherot, starting from Chesed, Gevorah, Tiferet, going all the way down to Yesod. And, the, and these are all masculine um, energies. And the feminine energy of the spherot is called Malchut. Malchut is considered feminine because feminine energy represents receiving and masculine energy represents giving. So Malchut is a spherot that has no light of its own. It receives the light from the upper sephirot. So, when um, when we learn in Bereshit about um, about Adam and Chava, we're really learning um, a story about the cosmic tree. And we'll we'll unpack that right now. So, when Adam and Chava ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil they were both diminished um, from their spiritual stature. And then um, they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden and the process of Tikkun began. But there was a parallel story before the story of Adam, which also um, explains the dynamics of the divine energies of masculine and feminine, which is the story of the creation of the moon and the sun and the stars. So it says, um, this is also in Bereshit in Genesis. It says, And God made the two great lights. The, the, the great light, the big light to rule over the day. And the, um, the small light to rule in, um, in the nighttime. So... You're, already there's a story there in that one pasuk. First it says that there were two big lights, and then it says there was one big one and there was one small one. What happened? What happened to the two big lights? How did one become small? So Rashi comes to the rescue and, and shares um, a midrash that says that, I think it was Chulin, uh, midrash in Chulin, it says, Shavim nivra'u, they were created equal, 
ונתמעתה הלבנה, and the moon became um, diminished, על שכתרגה, because she complained, ואמרה, אם, איך אם כן משני מלכים שהשתמשו בכתר אחד, she's like, how is it possible for two kings to use one crown? So, there's a lot of um, commentaries about this, like, why would she complain? What would be the problem with the moon and the sun? and the sun ruling, why wouldn't that be possible? Anything is possible in the world of infinity, the world that Hashem created. So there's, there's a lot to be unpacked about this story of why the moon complained. But as a consequence of the moon complaining about the two lights not being able to rule at the same time, Hashem diminished the moon. And so Kabbalah identifies the, the moon with the sphere of Malchut with the Shekhinah, with the Divine Feminine. So this, this, this story of the moon and the sun and the diminishment of the moon and then the story of Adam and Chava and the fall from Eden from, by eating from the tree, these two stories are interconnected. They're both talking about how the Divine Masculine and Feminine energies were in an actualized state and then there was a diminishment. And that the diminishment was specifically coming from the side of the feminine. So what happened to the moon? Or what happened to the feminine? The feminine no longer had its own light. The moon has no light of its own. It has to reflect the light that comes to it from the sun. So just like the sphere of Malchut has no spiritual energy or power of its own, but is only receiving the light that is coming from the upper sphere of Zeranpin, the divine masculine. So we see here... The, for me, personally, what really drew me to this topic was growing up um, and always learning Torah, Hashem was always presented in the masculine. And I always wondered why, why can't we ever hear anything about Hashem relating to us from the perspective of the feminine. Being a girl or at the time or being a woman as an adult, it always bothered me that I didn't see expressions of the divine in the feminine. I mainly saw majority, if not all of the expressions of God in the Torah are in the masculine. And that really bothered me. And I think that any woman who lives in modern times would get bothered reading the Torah and not seeing a feminine expression in the Torah. And I think that that's what drew me um, as a young adult, what drew me to Kabbalah is that Kabbalah really goes deep on the storyline between the masculine and feminine and honoring the feminine and explaining the unique role that the feminine has in the ultimate storyline of bringing the world to redemption, bringing the world to Geula. So we see here how the diminishment of the moon started the journey or the process of Tikkun, which is the world that we live in right now, and that in order for us to reach Geula, which we did, which redemption, the moon has to come back to a place of wholeness. Now, the moon is not just about women, and it's not just about the divine feminine. The moon really represents humanity. It really represents the entire world because we're all on the receiving end, and we're completely dependent on God. The world is ruled by God and Hashem sustains us every day. And so we are all part of the, um, the divine feminine. Now, obviously, the embodiment, the embodiment of the feminine is within women, but both men and women have masculine and feminine energies within them. So let's explore how this story of the divine feminine has um, continued over centuries. So... We know that in the last, I don't know, 100, 150 years, we, we could easily say that women have stepped into greater lights and have definitely more access to resources like education and work opportunities and leadership roles and women in power and government. So we definitely see that there's been a rise of the feminine reflected um, in, in, the, in history. Um, but we still know that in the last thousands of years and still till today, we still 
live in a state of hierarchy, right? And what Kabbalah teaches us is that we're moving from the world of the lines, lines representing hierarchy, sort of like a ladder, like someone who has more power or less power, more wisdom or less wisdom, more uh, financial resources, less financial. There's always better or worse, right? That's the hierarchy. That's the world of the lines, up and down. Um, but that we're moving towards the world of the circles and circle um, consciousness represents equality in the sense that God represents the center of the circle and there we're all equidistant from the circle so we all have easy not easy but we all have equal access to the center and so what that means from the place of consciousness is like for example now I'm teaching you something that you may or may not have known already so you're relying on me to give you something that you don't know but in the future in the time of redemption everyone's going to have direct access and revelation to Hashem so we're not going to need teachers anymore everyone's going to have their own unique experience and revelation of Hashem and so we're, we, we all have equal access there isn't one that's more knowledgeable than the other So we're really talking about Geula really, really represents um, the human spirit evolving to a place of spiritual potential where we can bond with our source and reach a place of wholeness. And so what Kabbalah teaches us is that the divine feminine plays a huge part in this ultimate journey that all of humanity is moving towards and that it's important for us to be aware of this process. Now, firstly, before I, I continue more about the Divine Feminine, I do want to mention that within the Torah perspective, the unique w role that women have is in the Torah, the classic statement is, um, that in the merit of righteous um, women, we were redeemed, meaning like in the time of um, Mitzrayim. And in the future, we will also be redeemed in the merit of righteous women. So we see here in the Torah that at the seed level, when redemption happened, it was due to the merit of women, um, or at least that was a big part of it. There were other factors that were involved, but that was a huge part of it. And then in the future, we will also have a very important role to fulfill. Now, what exactly was the unique role that women fulfilled in ancient times that contributed to the Geula? So one of the main things that they say is that First of all, they had emuna, right? They have complete faith. And we see this most clearly demonstrated in the fact that as um, the Jewish people were crossing the Red Sea, that Miriam gathered the women in a circle and brought out the tambourines and all the women played the tambourines. So the first question is, what are they doing with tambourines in the middle of the desert of all the essential things that they could have brought with them for survival in the desert. Why did they bring tambourines? So it was an expression of their Muna in, in the sense that they knew that God was going to redeem them. They were already prepared for redemption. They were already prepared for success and for freedom. And that's part, a huge part of Muna is that you already trust in Hashem. You have bitachon in Hashem. And you feel a sense of tranquility in knowing that Hashem will come through for you. And so that's a huge part of, of, um, of redemption is connecting to Amuna and trusting that Hashem is endless giving, endless love, only wants good for us, and that ultimately everything is going to be for the good. We also know that the women were very righteous in the sense that even after the receiving of the Torah, the women didn't, didn't participate in the sin of the golden calf. They didn't participate in the sin of the spies, and they ended up meriting to go to Israel even when the men didn't merit because they were so righteous in their, in their depth of connection to Hashem. So we see that um, women definitely played a, a, a tremendous role, and I want to share some sources with you about what they what um, we learned from uh, from the prophets from the Nevi'im about about this whole theme of the moon um, reestablishing itself and coming into fullness. 
So there's a really famous um, uh, prophecy from Isaiah where it says, "Vehaya or halevana ke or hama, ve or hama yeshivatayim ke or shivatayamim." It says that the light of the moon will be like the light of the sun, and that the light of the sun will be like the light of the seven days. So there's this emphasis on how the moon will go back to its wholeness. And then there's this other verse in Tehillim where it says, "Vilayla ki yom and the night will will be illuminated um, like the day. So there's lots of references. I just brought you a couple where um, where the prophets share that in the future um, there will be wholeness uh, and the moon will be re reestablished. Okay, so now I'd like to share with you how does this actually happen? How does the moon go back to its full light? How does the divine feminine actually return to its fullness? Um, and so obviously this is a process that plays out over, over history, but um, let's explore it. And let's really, I feel like it's important for me to clarify that um, this is not about like glorifying the feminine and putting down, God forbid, the masculine. It's really about us understanding that we have both energies, both men and women have both masculine and feminine energies within us, and that you need to have an equal balance in order for the world to heal. And so it's really, what, what really compelled me to share this teaching today was within the context of like the times that we live in and to really understand you know, that the way that the world is, is um, unfolding with all the different um, things we've been dealing with in the last few years, whether it's um, wars or pandemics or, um, you know, political conflicts and all these things that, that really demonstrate a lot of imbalance in the world. Um, not to blame it on the men, but it's really representing imbalance within masculine energy. Sort of like this old paradigm of competition, hierarchy, domination. You know, it's like the old school way of, of running the world where um, there's a lot of conflict and economic hardship and politics and all that kind of stuff. So it's really about like, what is, the, that's the old world way of, of, of life. What can we do to shift things into a new dimension, a new way of, of approaching? Um, so it's really about how do we develop the feminine aspects that are within all of us? So, well, we know, for example, let's talk about what are, how, what are masculine energy and what is feminine energy just to co compare and contrast a little bit um because we have both energies within us right so like masculine energy is more about like logic reason action um decisiveness being assertive power strength um loyalty these are all great um traits if used within balance right and so um it's connected also to the left brain energy, where like left brain is considered more logical and analytical and responsible for reasoning. So this is about taking action, right? It's about taking action and stability and security. That's like a very strong masculine uh, qualities, right? Which is very important. It's like protecting your, your family, protecting your community, taking care of the ones that are in need. That's masculine. Now, it's very outward focus versus feminine energy, which is more like inward. Um, feminine energy is more connected to like the right side of the brain, like more spiritual, more artistic, um, more like connected to the emotions and intuition, um, patience, uh, nurturing, expression, uh, gentleness, all these kinds of things. So we see that we, we, if you were to sit down and talk to anyone, they would say that they can relate to these qualities within themselves, whether they're a man or a woman. We all have these different um, qualities within ourselves. But now I I'd like to talk about if we wanted to activate more of the divine feminine within ourselves, if we saw that 
the world could use more of the feminine energy? What are the, the things we could do to activate more of the divine energy? Whether it's on the micro or on the macro level, whether it's in the personal or on the global, what are some of the core traits of divine feminine energy and, and just like in general feminine energy that can be applied and activated to really tip the scale from, from imbalance of like masculine energy and, and create a, um, an equal, um, equal uh, what's the word, a distribution of, of power. Okay, so I would say the number one thing um, as far as how we activate the divine feminine within is by living from the heart and leaning into our feelings versus into our mind. Now the mind obviously is extremely important and we need to use our mind to make logical decisions and choices, but we shouldn't neglect our feelings and our intuitions. We should pay attention to them and to really listen to our heart and be more sensitive to our heart when it gives us guidance, right? And it's not just about um, how we relate to our heart ourself, for ourselves, but also about how we are with others in the sense of are we sensitive to others? Are we caring of others? Do we love ourselves? And if we love ourselves, how can we love others as well? So it's really, I would say, this is like the essential quality is connecting to your heart. The next thing I would say is more about embracing care and community, right? Like being okay with asking for help, being okay with asking for support, not feeling like ego-centered that like, oh, I got this or I can figure this out by my own. Being okay with being vulnerable and opening yourself up for people to give to you. You know, part of being feminine represents receiving energy to be comfortable with receiving and to not feel like it's a sign of weakness to receive that it's actually creating bonding and connection by allowing others to help you and to care for you this leads us to another an amazing quality which is the quality of compassion you know the the the, the sephira for the heart center in the tree of life is tiferet tiferet energy represents compassion, um, balance, beauty, love. So um, it's about finding ways to, 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 to see things from another person's perspective and to really have forgiveness and kindness and compassion for them. Another very key um, factor of being feminine is having a strong intuition. So intuition, I think, is something that is developed over time and the more you listen to your intuition the more you try you trust it and it's like feeling a nudge and knowing how to listen to that inner voice that tells you maybe you should pay attention to this person maybe you should take this with you maybe this is something that you should have in mind like really learning how to it's really like your soul whispering to you right your intuition and listening to that part of yourself and then that's something that we could, um, you know, develop and nurture very deeply through meditation. Um, learning how to quiet our mind and to sit in stillness is a very powerful way to develop our intuition and get guidance from our soul. Um, creativity. Creativity is also a very powerful um, aspect of um, the divine feminine. Learning how to explore your different interests and passions and talents and to learn how to try new things and be creative and you know go outside of the box of like the way you normally do things and the way you normally think and just find new approaches new ways new angles um and just be flexible um what, what's essential i think more than anything is like learning empathy, learning sensitivity to others that when someone is in pain or someone is in need or someone needs, you know, someone to listen to them, to, to really to de develop empathy and, and kindness, to just find ways to care for other people. I think we live in a, in a time when there's so much emphasis on presenting yourself in the world as like, you know, with social media or whatever as like living a perfect life or, you know, you have it all figured out. But there's so many times I've seen that people 
that I know who present on the outside, you know, everything's going great. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, their life is crumbling. And so I think it's important to be real and to emphasize that and to show all sides of life, not just the perfect, beautiful, you know, uh, polished aspects of who we are, but to really show vulnerability and the flaws and the journeys that we all go through to overcome the flaws and to overcome our weaknesses and to show our process of learning and growing and learning and growing, I think is so much more interesting to show the world versus a perfect picture, which no one can really live up to. Um, let's see what else. Learning to forgive quickly, learning to be a good communicator, really learning how to listen to others. I think that, you know, um, a lot of communication is about you don't have to agree with what the other person is saying, but you do need to respect other people's perspectives and allow them to have that perspective without being, you know, aggressive or defensive or attacking others because they don't believe in the same exact things that you do. I think um, that's a huge problem uh, that we experience in today's world is this uh, extreme sort of polarity that people... Um, the, the way that people communicate, you know, um, it's a huge one. And overall, I think for me, if I was to um, talk about the divine feminine in a way that for me personally has been very, very meaningful is experiencing Hashem in, in the sense that um, like, a, like a divine mother, you know, like I feel like we grow up so much of our way of interacting with Hashem is like as the father and and that's beautiful. I think, though, um, the feminine um, aspect of God if, is if when you tap into it and you really try to resonate with it, it's like very nurturing, very um, like unconditional love, no judgment, accepting ourselves for who we are, like really feeling like God loves us no matter what. And that it's not about deserving or being worthy of God's love that wherever we are, Hashem will meet us there and Hashem loves us unconditionally and um, and also takes care of our needs, everyone according to their needs, just like a mother takes care of her kids and what they need um, and loves her kids no matter what. I think that that's a very important way to approach God and to experience God is that Hashem loves you no matter what, like completely completely unconditionally with flaws and all. And I think that that's a very, very special way um, to build our relationship with God. If you can tap into that and to figure out how to access that, I think is very, very special. Um, and last but not least, I will say that this is definitely one of my tr most dominant traits is the gift of gab, right? Like women love to talk <laughs> and we are very much about communication and dialogue and I think that's you know the power of speech is very very powerful especially in women and um, I think that when you learn Kabbalah and you learn Torah and you learn about how Hashem created the world through speech it's very interesting because if you think about it when it says and Hashem said let there be light and there was like who was God talking to <laughs> there was no one there yet you know like speech by default represents relationship, right? That when you have speech, you have relationship. And so God was creating relationship through dialogue and women create relationship through dialogue. And that I think is very important in society is to learn how to figure things out through dialogue, through communication, through inclusion, and to really... Um, understand other people's perspectives and just allow people to feel safe and can communicate within like a safe space I think is very very powerful and is something that women do for each other um, is just create a safe space to just process things through dialogue and imagine how different the world would be if we used talk and speech and diplomacy way more than aggression and um, you know, other things that are very harmful. So I also wanted to, to say that, you know, we also have the power of speech to use towards empowering others, you know, that 
you, you can't imagine how saying something kind to others can be so, um, such a big influence on on another person and when you see the when you see the good in another person when you see the potential in another person when you empower someone to live their their dream um speech is very very powerful way more powerful sometimes i think than actions both in the positive and in the negative sense and i think that as a mom i can say that's something that i i've experienced um and i think that um we should pay more attention to the words that we say and um, and how and how we we communicate with each other. So that's it for today. Um, obviously, there's a lot more we can say about these topics. Kabbalah is layers upon layers on everything. But I really wanted you all to just tap into the energy of the Shekhinah, the Divine Feminine, understanding that this is another way, another approach in which we can um, connect to Hashem with Shavuot coming up and realizing that revelation didn't just happen hundreds and thousands of years ago at Sinai, but it, it's constantly happening and Hashem is always communicating with us, always um, giving us um, revelation and inspiration and we should always open it, just listen, <laughs> go quiet, go still, Go meditate, go daven, learn Torah, and really, you know, the Shekhinah always rests in a place where there's Torah. That's why Hashem gave us Torah. It's it's our way. Uh, it's that it's that interface. It's that meeting point. Torah is that meeting point for us with Hashem, and also Tefillah. Torah and Tefillah are the our two greatest tools that Hashem, and gifts that Hashem gave us to communicate, to create a dialogue. And the dialogue isn't just about talking. It's also about listening. So it's very, very important that we learn to also be receptive as as the feminine is receptive to hearing Hashem always talk to us, always inspire us, always guide us. And I bless you that in this special, beautiful month of Sivan that you should be able to tap into the divine revelation within your soul and to really access your highest self and to really be a shining light in your in your family, in your community. And, and in the greater global um, world and always remember that Hashem loves you no matter what and that um, and that the Torah is, is our biggest gift that we can um, we can cherish and share with our families for generations so blessings for Chodesh Tov and I look forward to um, to being in touch with all of you soon take care